welcome to Alzheimer Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm so excited that you're joining us today. We are going to have a fascinating conversation, as usual, as we learn from people all around the world at all ages and stages of life. Stay tuned as we shift our dementia care from crisis to comfort. Here we go. What you think about Well, hi, everyone, and welcome to Alzheimer's Speaks Radio. I'm your host, Lori LeBay, and I'm thrilled that you are with us today. We're going to have a tough conversation, but we hope to make it comfortable. And that topic is pediatric and young adults living with Lewy body. This is a story of inspiration and help and hope. And uh, even though we're opening Pandora's box, um, I think you're going to find it pretty fascinating. One family story where they had two children living with Lewy body dementia. If you are new to Alzheimer's Speaks, I want to welcome you, first of all. Uh, this was developed because my own mother lived with dementia for 30 years. And I just felt that we needed platforms to have comfortable conversations where we could share real stories and remove the isolation and give hope and make connections to services, products, and tools. So with that in mind, I want to let you know, too, that we've updated our website, alzheimerspeaks.com. We've made it much easier for you to access all of our free educational resources on one page. We are going to hear from the Adaptive Equipment and Caregiving Corner, and then we're going to be right back and introduce you to our guest today. I love the foot bar walker, and let me tell you why. It is the option for my toolbox that I've been waiting for. Let's be honest. There are some clients who, despite our best rehab efforts, just aren't able to return to performing a sit-to-stand transfer on their own. Now I can offer my caregivers an easier, safer option that doesn't involve hoisting their loved one up from a sitting position. I don't recommend this walker for all of my clients, but I do recommend this walker for those caregivers looking for an easier, safer option with transfers. I would also encourage other therapists to add this walker to their toolbox. It's kind of like having my own mobile parallel bars for the client to pull up on. Whether it's a family caregiver at home helping a loved one with Parkinson's or dementia, CNAs in a long-term care facility assisting their patients, or therapists adapting to client and caregiver specific needs, we now have a very safe and effective option to offer in the Footbar Walker. Check this product out at thefootbarwalker.com. That's it for today from Adaptive Equipment and Caregiving Corner. Have a great day and don't forget, if you can't do it, adapt it. Okay, we are back and I'm really excited to have this conversation. So today I am thrilled. We have Lorena Demian with us, who has been on our show before, um, back about seven years ago. And she's actually had two of her three children diagnosed with Lewy body dementia. So we're going to be hearing about her experience. And my guess is she's got a lot more to tell us about her journey. Now, in addition to Lorena, we also have Dr. Rosemary Laird with us and Deanna Vigliata. And for those of you that aren't familiar with Dr. Laird, she's a geriatrician and she has 25 years experience as a medical director for not just one, but two memory disorder clinics in Florida. Dr. Laird is a passionate advocate for the support of not only those diagnosed, but those that care for them. And she also co-authored the book called Take Your Oxygen First, Preserving Your Health and Happiness While Caring for a Loved One with Alzheimer's Disease. Now, Deanna, on the other hand, is the national sales manager for CENI, which has premium adult incontinence products. She has an extensive background of 30 years in healthcare sales and health management. She joined the CENI team um, about 2019 to help expand their brand here in the U.S. And boy, uh, they are taking it by storm. This is a company that wants to bring dignity and comfort and flexibility and spontaneity back into people's lives. They do a lot of training for not only consumers, 
but also for professionals as well, from senior housing to home health care. And we'll hear a little bit about their high quality, breathable incontinence products. So ladies, I am so thrilled to have you all with us today. This is going to be just an exceptional conversation and probably uncomfortable for some people to hear, but I really urge our audience to stay with us because dementia is such an important topic. And, you know, we want to remove some of the stigmas and and some of those stigmas have to do with age and when, you know, when dementia might possibly be able to hit you. And really the door is open to any of us at any time is I think what we're finding out more and more. And though pediatric and um, young adult dementia isn't as common, it still exists and people need to be aware of that. So Dr. Laird, I'm going to go to you first, if you don't mind uh, sharing, if you've been touched in your own family or circle of friends by dementia. Sure. Hi, Lori. And Thank you for this opportunity. I actually have not uh, surprisingly been uh, affected in my own personal uh, family. And I say surprisingly because of just how common this illness is. And certainly in my extended group of friends, um, it is starting to become more discussed uh, because many more people are being touched by this. But my experience has really drawn from my work in the clinical setting all these years where I've met so many individuals and their families who've been affected by this illness. So I feel like I'm sort of there watching along and hopefully doing my part to take what I've learned from their experience and uh, be sure that other professionals learn about it as well uh, so that we can really improve things because the experience that these people do have, um, I can tell even though I'm not in it myself, I can tell how really challenging these situations are to say the least. Well, and I appreciate you wanting to spread the word. I think when it comes to dementia, we all have to be lifelong learners because, you know, in my eyes, this is kind of a baby disease. We don't know a whole lot. And so we have to keep these conversations going in a comfortable manner um, if we're really going to be able to serve and know what's going on. Um, Next, I'm going to go to Deanna. How about you? Have you been touched in your own family or circle of friends? I have, Lori. On my dad's side, my aunt had dementia and uh, passed from it. Um, And just in the last, I'm going to say, six months or so, more and more of my friend's parents have early onset. So, and and some people I've even traveled with and have spent time with. So it's um, concerning, like it gets closer and closer, the, the, the circle around me, so to speak. Yeah, and I think that that's pretty common for most of us in in any circumstances. Once we've been touched, it's kind of like when you buy a new car, all of a sudden, well, there's a zillion of the same color and the same style on the road. I never noticed those before, but, you know, it it perks our interest and we we listen deeper um, and harder because we're looking, we're all looking for answers. Now, Lorena, for you, uh, you know, I mentioned in the intro that you have um, two children that both were diagnosed with Lewy body. Why don't you give us a, a, just a little background and then we'll, we'll go a little deeper on that as well. Well, um, my son, um, he and his sister is still difficult to talk about. Mm-hmm. Um, he began losing skills when he was young and it took us till 17 to get the neuropsych testing and the testing done for the diagnosis of dementia because insurance didn't want to believe he could have it. Um, but he fought hard and long. Um, sadly, he lost his life in, sorry, in no, 2015. He, he really wanted to be here and he told me to make sure that no matter what, not to let people forget him, you know? And then six months later, my oldest daughter was diagnosed. She's now in the later stages of the disease and she has the fluctuations of Lewy body. Now they're doing genetic testing again to see if it's a, there's a genetic cause causing symptoms of Lewy body. Um, we haven't found out the results yet. So yeah, this is hard. 
This is this is really tough. Now, with with David, how old was he when he passed in 2015? He was 23. 23. So yeah, that's incredible. Um, the journey that you've been on. And I, I just have to say, you know, before we even really dive into this, thank you so much because I can't imagine how difficult this is, but yet you're following through on David's wishes, make my life be a legacy to learn for other people and share. And that's such a beautiful thing for you to honor that. So um, really, really appreciate you um, being with us today. Thank you. And thank you for the opportunity. So you were on the show about seven years ago when David, you know, was still alive and I know your journey has significantly changed. I mean, you, you mentioned his passing, you mentioned now Jessica, now, um, now being diagnosed and in her later stages. One of the things that I would love to hear, you know, you, you, you talked about the difficulty of getting diagnosed. And I think no matter who has dementia, that's like the number one complaint out there is getting a diagnosis. So um, can, you, can you tell us the, the added frustration of just having children and like you said, insurance and the doctors, nobody really wanted to believe that this could even be a possibility. How did that affect you as a family? It was hard. Um, we had, he had a mental health therapist that kept insisting it was organic. And she was the one that was able to finally get the, te- the neuropsych testing um, involved and started. But and by the time he was tested, they said it. Well, he was severely impacted in five, all five areas of the brain by that time, um, and that was in like 2012. It, it is a struggle because for David, they wouldn't let him see a doctor that specializes in dementia. He was too young. He had to see a general neurologist, one of the first general neurologists. He had looked at me and said, how do you spell the word Louie? So it's difficult. And at one point when he was seven, um, they told me that I was making him that way. And I wasn't, but parents are often like, you must be doing something to cause this because kids don't get this. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Dr. Laird, do you have a comment on that? I, I would imagine you do as a as a doctor and professional yourself in the industry. Do you see this as pretty common? Well, before I say that, as a physician, I'll just apologize to Lorena and the many, many other people who, especially that comment about being blamed or even a suggestion of, of some sort of parental, you know, lacking that or, or action that caused this. I, I can't imagine that being even uttered. Uh, and yet it, it happens. And I've actually heard other variations of this as you probably have too, Lorena. And so I apologize for that. I, I think uh, what I can say is that the no one deserves that sort of, of um, you know, help. And my hope is that by these sorts of forums where we talk about these experiences and having someone as, you know, strong as Lorena come forward with that, we can help other people know that that's not acceptable, it's not right, and it's, it's really not what it should be. Uh, the, the type of stigma that exists around mental health, even even what Lorena was saying, she was told it must be organic. If you think of that word organic, it kind of means real, as opposed to sort of what we think of the mental health uh, diagnoses in general. Those are sort of those over there psychiatric diagnoses. And so right there, you're setting people up for being put into this stigmatized setting where there's, you know, shame and embarrassment and all of those sort of personal feelings that are piled on someone right when they need our help. The reality of these illnesses is unfortunately a degeneration of the brain after it's been fully developed. 
And whether it was at 15 years or 55 years, the degeneration that sets in doesn't doesn't discriminate. <laughs> it sets in and it creates the disease. That's the one interesting thing about this. No matter what the age is, there is increasing evidence that the pathology, that's the, the way something causes a sickness, mm -hmm. that happens in a similar way, no matter when it starts. And so what, what my response is, to my colleagues from a professional standpoint is, you know, you need to set aside the age and you look at like, we're all trained to a collection of circumstances and symptoms, which are things people tell us and signs, which are things we can see. You put that together to create diagnosis and you, you have to, you know, not get caught up in some of those less, um, sort of less concrete pieces of evidence, but as human beings, it's, it's natural that we sometimes get off track a bit. Yeah. I, I can't imagine even what that did to you personally, kind of being accused that you're doing this, you know, to your I, child. Yeah. and then also how David must've felt too. I mean, if he heard that, I mean, affecting your relationship or wanting to defend you, I think back to um, when my daughter was younger, and she'll kill me for sharing this story, but I don't care. It kind of, it kind of relates. She, she had menstrual cramps horribly to the point where she would just get boo white. She'd get the chills. She'd be cold. She'd be sweaty. She'd get a temperature. And, and I'll never forget the doctor said it was all in her head. And I just about blew a gasket. I ended up reporting him. I'm like, how can she make herself get a fever? How can I witness all of these symptoms? And you're telling us we're both nuts. I mean, I, I, I was, I, you know, it was, it was like, he was lucky. I wasn't a wild animal let out of my cage. Cause I, I just, I probably would have killed him, you know, and I knew that I had to go through certain formats, but I was so upset and so disgusted and felt so alone in terms of how do I help my child? And I mean, I'm talking menstrual cramps, you know, you're, you know, that, that hits once a month, it was still devastating to her life. And you're, you're talking a major disease that can take your child's life. I, I can't even imagine the pain, the anger, the frustration. I mean, all of the trust being lost with that did you end up changing doctors and and I know sometimes that's not as easy to do when as this, we all think it is too when this happened um David um was in the hospital and an, it was an intern and David didn't know what was going on he was having cognitive decline he was confused and I was actually approached and as police escorted away from my son for 10 days, I had to prove that I did not hurt him. And sadly, other parents that I've networked with that have children with dementia, there's three of those that had similar experiences because nobody thinks a child can have these kind of problems. Wow. So Dr. Laird, what's that called? Munchkin's disease when they think the mother... Oh, Munchausen's Munch, okay. and, and, and that's a, yeah. And that's, it's, it, it's a similar, it, it's, it's a confusion, if you will, around the, what these, what they're seeing and what they're being told about the course of someone's life mm -hmm. and this illness. And it, it just, it's, it's, so unusual or it's so unexpected against the normal set of facts we know about this condition. And I think someone said earlier, we're like in the baby or infancy mm -hmm. stage of knowing anything about these illnesses. And that's very true. And so our level of sophistication about being able to understand the pathology and being able to diagnose is in that sort of infancy stage too. And to continue the uh, analogy, you have a lot more mistakes in those sort of early days of life where you, you, you just don't know everything and you don't have all the skills. Mm -hmm. So I, I think to 
you know, improve things, these sorts of forums help and additional education from a medical education standpoint helps as well. And the people who are really doing a lot of that are the advocacy groups, um, the groups that get together with the parents who are affected by this and uh, Lorena coming forward on a program like this, because this really does get the attention of as it sort of collects itself and increases. And then that is what raises awareness. Fortunately, there was at least one clinician who knew that it wasn't a mental health and moved Lorena and her son through towards a diagnosis. You know, what we need to do now is make more of those individuals spread more throughout the different, you know, places in our country and the world so that those awarenesses happen more quickly and those recognitions get people on the right path to a diagnosis. Right. Thank you. Now, Lorena, uh, one of the things, you know, I always like to look at is kind of bummers and blessings you, with all different things that happen in our lives. And I would imagine your bummer list could be awfully long when you're talking about the loss of a child and, you know, another, another one now being diagnosed. But if you had to highlight three things that really affected your life in a, in a, in a negative fashion regarding this disease, what would they be? Understanding what's going on with my child, knowing, you know, getting a diagnosis to this point, we still don't know um, if it was a genetic or a Lewy body diagnosis at this time. It does say Lewy body on its death certificate, but just not knowing. Mm -hmm. And genetic tests don't always show things. And right now, Jessica's going through a testing called whole genome um, that wasn't available when David was here. Mm -hmm. Um, patients, um, I have learned so much about dementia from living through it, <laughs> so, but, you know, patients learning, my son was an amazing young man that wanted to help others, wanted to be there, wanted to make sure no other kid got this. Wow. Now for, for you personally, um, push your kids aside, how has it changed how you envisioned your life? Oh, it definitely changed a lot of things. Um, now it's like I appreciate every single day knowing that tomorrow's not promised, enjoying life to the fullest. Um, Jessica, as long as she's able to, and David too, we go out. With David, we went to the Children's Museum. We did things like car races that he liked. For Jessica, it's Disney. And we are at Disney in Florida at least once a year. Um, this year, it'll be twice. So really appreciating what's important, what makes people happy, what are their passions. I think that that is a beautiful life lesson, you know, that you're taught. We so often, I think, have our little checklists of where we're supposed to be and what other people's expectations, you know, we're trying to meet those even in an unconscious manner, you know, sometimes with that. Um, now, let me ask you this, because you, you have another daughter, Andrea, uh, who isn't affected by this. How has, how has this affected her life? It's affected her a lot. Um, she she um, learned about dementia really early on. She is high-functioning special needs. All three of my kids have been special needs. She has epilepsy, um, and but she is control. That's controlled through medication, and she just literally. I am so thankful that she is doing it so well, and she is doing things that and stuff and it does affect her because there are will be things Andrea wants to do and we can't go because Jessica's having a bad night mm -hmm. and she's learned to sort of roll with the flow and plan be it wow that's that's exceptional that's hard for any of us to learn at any age some days mm -hmm. and and to to learn that you know as a child um you know within your own family circumstances 
what are some things that you really feel have been blessings in this? And I know people are thinking, Lori, are you crazy? Really? Blessings? What, what can, what can come of good out of, out of going through this journey? Um, I think that the blessings would be every day is so precious and so valuable. And yes, it's hard to find the blessings to all the other stuff, but um, yes, I'm very thankful that I was chosen to be David's mom and Jessica's and Andrea's. Jessica is totally different with David with the progression of this disease. But again, every person is different. It's just a blessing to be able to see the smiles when they come and watch them, um, you know, not let this disease get them down. I agree with you. You know, my mom had dementia for 30 years. And for me, it, it simplified life in terms of what was, what was really important, what was raw that really touched your heart. And it made you look and, and see the very little things that I think a lot of times we overlook in life because we're too busy being busy. But like you said, the, the, the you know, smile, a glint in the eye, a giggle, um, just that pure joy that I think sometimes we don't appreciate the value of that when we're, when we're being busy, you know, we're, we're looking for the bigger things that really don't touch our heart and our soul. The other thing I guess I found, and I'm, I'm interested if you found this too, on my journey with my mom, I found that there were different levels of unconditional love that I didn't know existed. And yes. do you see that too? The, the more they progress, it's like the stronger your connections really are. Yes, I do. Um, it's, you know, amazing. Um, the things that we've been through and I could spend, I could write a book, but um, right now it's just amazing to see those different levels and feel that connection uh, right up, you know, until the time he passed, holding his hand, being there for him. He was kept insisting to his hospice nurse he was going to live to be a hundred. And he told her, that she wasn't doing her job because she didn't give him morphine fast enough. And as a parent, that is so hard to look at, but you know, every precious moment he was here. Well, and that really is food for the soul to, to keep you going, keep you connected. Those, those little moments. I know, you know, my mom's been gone since 2014. David's been gone since 2015. You said, and I can look back and it just softens, it, it softens my heart, even when I'm having a bad day, thinking of those precious moments and so grateful to have those. And again, some people really focus on the negativity and that somebody's gone. And, you know, I really try to look at, gosh, it wouldn't hurt this bad if I didn't love this deeply. So how lucky am I to have this kind of pain? Because with this kind of pain comes that kind of joy at the whole other level that makes it worth it. And some people might be shaking their heads going, Lori, you're just crazy. <laughs> but, but that's how I've learned to frame it. Um, and because I, I, I personally think that there's a lesson in, in all journeys in life and, and finding that. So thank you for sharing that. I want to go to Dr. Lord. One, I'm wondering, have you seen a, a lot of younger patients yourself um, and if so, were you surprised by that? And if not, um, are you are you hearing or seeing peers recognizing young adults and pediatrics with uh, with dementia? So I have never had someone as young as as um, you know Lorena, your son. Um, so that would be unusual for me to see. Um, the youngest individual I uh, personally took care of was diagnosed at 38. And it was a known um, genetic defect in that family. And so there was a, a different path uh, because of its, you know, it being an understood um, sort of problem in that family. 
Uh, beyond that, the other area I've gotten involved with younger people is um, in individuals who have Down syndrome. Mm -hmm. There is an unfortunate connection between Down syndrome and Alzheimer's disease. And it's, it's interesting to this conversation. The very first time I learned about it myself was because I had a family come to me with their 30 uh, year old uh, sibling who had Down syndrome and they were being turned away uh, or told a variety of things similar to you, Lorena, about mental health. Uh, they were doing the wrong things to try to interact with, with you know, their sibling and just all sorts of things. And here it was this group of siblings trying to, their parents had passed, so trying to take care of this, you know, sibling to the best of their ability. And in fact, they were facing Alzheimer's disease, not anything else. And so that opened my eyes. And subsequently, I ended up doing a, a fair amount of, of work in that area. So it's that same sort of unrecognizability of something that we're not expecting that, that I think creates some of the problem. But um, the, the realities of what the families face are, uh, even after you get past that you know, increased difficulty for diagnosis. Um, the entire course of the illness is often not met with as much support as, as would be ideal. And Lorena, you were saying earlier how important it was to have a diagnosis and to have probably someone who could tell you, well, this is what to expect now and in the future. And that sort of knowledge is really important. And, and I think in my own practice, we've tried to make sure that we get the word out so that if people do have individuals in the younger state, I'm a geriatrician. So everyone always said, well, Dr. Laird won't see anyone under 65. And I can't tell you how many times I said, I will see anyone who thinks that, you know, they're having trouble with their memory or thinking mm -hmm. is how I put it too, because that's a whole nother discussion. It doesn't always present first with the classic short-term memory symptoms that, you know, everyone talks about. So uh, in any event, yes, the, the age is becoming more, the younger onset is becoming more prevalent. There's probably a number of reasons for that. Uh, one of which is there's more people talking about it. So we don't push it aside and put it in the back closet if we have a symptom. And for that, I'm grateful because no one will be helped if we continue the path of, you know, stigmatizing and brushing it aside. Um, so I'm glad people are coming forward. We also know that as we get older, um, the numbers of people affected by this are going to increase. And, you know, we just all need to be prepared for that. Um, I think being prepared that it could be across a wider range of, of age groups is important. One of the interesting things that's, that's happened, uh, we've been talking primarily about situations where genetically um, someone is, is predisposed to having an illness. Um, and there isn't a lot we can do about our genetics at this point in time where it's sort of set. Um, the other area where there are increasingly, I'm worried about younger onset, younger individuals are because, um, we now have more of a knowledge of connection between diabetes and high blood pressure and Alzheimer's disease. And as more and more younger people have problems with diabetes, uh, the potential that that impact on their brain's overall health will show up sooner. Uh, is even more likely. And to Lorena's point earlier that often the initial symptoms, cognitive as well as some emotional, even a young person who's had you know, diabetes or high blood pressure and it, it is turning into something like Alzheimer's disease, they may be put into a category of mental health first. And if that happens, you lose your opportunity to help them from the standpoint of what we know helps people whose 
brains are threatened by diabetes and high blood pressure. You, you sort of move off of the right path. Mm-hmm. Another reason it's so damaging to have these you know, preconceived notions about what someone should or shouldn't have as a diagnosis and to eliminate the possibility that it is a dementia. Well, and once you get kind of categorized, it's hard to get out of that bucket too. You know, I mean, we see that all the time with our kids in school and the medical field as well. And everybody kind of keeps jumping down that rabbit hole. Absolutely. And and takes uh, typically something pretty devastating to change that is what I have found or just kind of an earth angel, like, like you had Lorena that just Mm -hmm. said, Hey, I'm going to fight for this. I don't think this is what it is. And we need more people having an open mind, looking at things from a broader, a broader picture in, in my mind. Um, Thank you, Dr. Lloyd for that. Um, Lorena, I want to ask you, um, because you had, you had mentioned that, you know, you guys love to go to Disney. That's kind of Jessica's hot spot there. And this year you're going to go twice. Um, But I'd love to have you tell about your experience with Cindy's products, because I know, you know, you had had told me that you weren't sure you were going to be able to go anymore because of the progression of the disease. So can you kind of set that up and, and explain to people how this product really affected, you know, not only Jessica, but you as a family and your your ability to be mobile? Sure. Back in March, Jessica was um, having incontinence to the point she would wet herself and it would go on. There would be a puddle of urine on the floor wherever we are. Or, and I thought, well, gee, we can't go to Disney like this. And then I heard Deanna on the, your radio show and I decided to give it a try. And it was like night and day. She doesn't, she doesn't leak through anymore. And now we can go to Disney um, because that's Jessica's. Honestly, it's one of the few places I ever see her smile. Mm -hmm. And with Jessica, Disney is so much more intense for her because she honestly believes she is Princess Leia. And she honestly will call Darth Vader her dad and dad, why don't you come over here? And then she talks with the stormtroopers and It's amazing that, and she's not hurting anybody, but to her, this is very real. And she, it makes, it makes her so happy. That's wonderful. You know, we always hear the phrase of live in their world. And I mean, you're really helping her create that comfort, that joy, those memories, and you're, you're stepping in and enjoying that with her, where I think so often People, families, professionals alike get into this right or wrong in this kind of corrective mode of, of what reality is. And, and when we do that, we don't, we don't always look at stripping away that joy and that comfort, which is what all of us want in life. We, we, we want to feel accepted. We want to feel joy. We want to feel comfortable. And again, Lorena, like you said, it's not hurting anybody at all. You know, it's just enhancing, it's, it's enhancing everybody by being able to see and feel that joy and that connection. You know, once we get our, our judgment and stuff out of the way with that. And so I, I appreciate you kind of leading by example, you know, with that. I also can totally relate to, um, you know, the work involved when you're dealing with somebody who is incontinent. I remember my dad, uh, for example, who was living with brain cancer and he got in a bad car accident. He came to, to live with us and he broke his arm and he, you know, broke his ribs. And so he was really slowed down. And I got a commode to say, dad, can you just use the commode? Cause he could never make it to the bathroom. And, you know, the hardwood floors, the tile floors, him, the bed, I mean, everything. And it was just, it was constant, like three times a day, you know, I'd have to be cleaning up and doing laundry. And I remember just sitting on the floor scrubbing one day, I'll still get emotional, just going, dad, can you please just use the commode? Because as a care partner, I was just exhausted. And I can imagine that that has really lifted you, not only Jessica, in terms of her feeling, gosh, you know, I made it through the night or, you know, we can go out and be mobile, but for you as a care partner, 
to, to A, see your daughter be proud and engaged, but to know that you don't have 45 extra loads of laundry and you don't have to be scrubbing the floor. I mean, I would think that that just changes your whole day. I, I know it did for me. Yes, it does. Um, I can't say enough good things about this product. Um, it's really, really let us still go out, still go to the movies, still go to, you know, different activities, go listen to um, music at Central Park. We have Central Park in Valparaiso <laughs> <It's> <laughs> not, and stuff, but she likes going and listening to music. She likes um, going places. And when she was doing this before we found Cindy, it was taking away her dignity. Mm -hmm. It was like, she was very embarrassed, but she says, mom, let's go to the movies anyway. I'm like, we got to take you back to the hotel and get you cleaned up. And she didn't understand that. All she wanted to go see was her movie. Yep. Let's go have fun. Yeah. And stuff. She's still angry with COVID because she can't, has to wear a face mask. She doesn't like doing that, but that's just what we have to do. Wow. Well, Deanna, I want to I want to bring you in because you are the most passionate soul I have ever seen in terms of dealing with an incontinence product. In fact, you don't even call it incontinence products. So often you refer to it as being a continence product um, and, and looking at it in a positive way. You know, you really look at this whole person approach. How did you come to that? Because I, I think I think you and your company are making such a huge difference in terms of how you are educating people and how you are engaging and, and, and really bringing that dignity in life and mobility, you know, and flexibility back to people. Mm. Yeah, we, um, I don't, you know, it's funny when you think back, I'm a, for anybody that knows me well, I'm big on ripple effects. I think life is just a ripple and a ripple can go positive and a ripple can go negative. And I think it's, I choose to see a ripple as positive, keep it going positive. But um, I, I just have to say, I'm, I'm in love with the company and the culture. Um, and I think if, if people are fortunate in their life to find a company where you align with the vision and the quest and the mission and in healthcare, to me, it has to be people first, profit second to work. It just, we just can't stray from that. And so um, every member that I work with uh, on the U.S. team here, and I've met our counterparts in, in Poland as well, um, I have nothing but wonderful salt of the earth people. Every single person cares about individuality. And it kind of, I think, comes from that is we look for... Um, I'd like to think that we can change the world maybe, but we, we know we can change somebody's world and we can probably do that every single day if we try and do that. So the quest is bigger of how it came to be to answer your, your question. And it's really about educating our country to shift our mindset from not just thinking of incontinence products as a disposable commodity, but shifting to think, if you're deep in the weeds with caring for someone or you yourself have incontinence, understanding that it's not about the product itself, it's about what that product, how it's constructed to provide, like Lorena mentioned, um, increasing dignity, increasing quality of life, increasing the moments, the pockets of joy in somebody's life who is incontinent and their caregivers, whether they're a spouse, an adult child, a loved one, or a paid caregiver, making the workflow go a little bit easier. So it's this bigger quest, I think, that um, uh, our entire team is on this mission to change. And so what we've been able to do, fortunately, is we've been able to align ourselves with people, truthfully, Lori, like you, truthfully, Dr. Laird, like you, Lorena, like you, I, I would just like to say to Lorena is I'm not a person who usually has uh, breakdowns with, with crying, but she, we sent her out some samples. And I thought with 
all that she has going on in her world, in her daily life. She called to say, thanks for the samples. And I thought to myself, oh my goodness, I need to be thanking you <laughs> for taking those samples, for trying, but you took time out of the day and you, and you put Jessica on the phone and we've had some dialogue back and forth since then. And I, and I think to myself, that's a blessing. When we talk about bummers and blessings, I've learned so much from Lorena's story. I've, I've listened to a podcast. I've looked at her Facebook. I've learned some little tidbits that, that hopefully I can share with other people and they learn. And, and again, it's that big ripple effect. So I think um, to, to your point, the products are just, they're, they're awesome. They're, they work, they work. So we increase dignity, we increase socialization we increase moments of time that are great and uh and from a healthcare perspective the the products are constructed in a way that we're decreasing negative clinical outcomes as i call them utis they the products are super absorbent so we help with that uh, we want people to sleep through the night uninterrupted and we're trying to educate that our rounding every two hours really stems back from Florence Nightingale days of the lady with the lamp taking two hours to go around and, and meet with the wounded soldiers. But we, we have high quality products now. We have different lighting now. We have mattresses now. We, we have all things that we say, we, we don't have to do that. We can let people sleep. And if they sleep, they get up and they're more alert, more engaged. And they don't get up, they don't fall. And then they don't end up at the ER. So all these things together is... Um, really part of the quest to just keep educating, educating, educating that um, there are good products on the market that can help a lot of people. Yeah, you had mentioned that, you know, really super um, absorbent and stuff, which cuts down on some people that deal with bed sores as well. And, you know, Lorena, you mentioned she didn't leak through onto the floor, which again, a lot of people slip and fall in their own urine. Um, that is a real common, I mean, you can ask anybody in the ER, <laughs> uh, that is a real common factor there. Um, sleeping through the night is huge. Um, now you have like leak guards as well, you know, with your product. And then you have a bunch of um, supplemental products too, to help the skin as well. We're very much on the proactive. Uh, if we use good quality products, if we use good skincare, we should never get to the ugly, uh, as I call it, of fixing things if we're proactive. And, and we even take it a step further of to say, you know, in a perfect world, we're doing something else, right? Another, another line for, for a role here, because if people are in a perfect world, we're all continent, mm -hmm. they would the product. So we try to offer education, offer tips of how do we keep as many people as we can continent first for the demographic that's not going to fit there. Now let's at least be able to provide um, a quality product and let it, let's do it proactively. And another part of that proactivity is educating uh, caregivers that you can have a great product, but those leak guards that you just mentioned, Lori, you have to activate a brief. You have to flip up that leak card for that uh, product to work as effectively as it as it should. So there's education tied in that we like to um, provide caregivers, whether it's um, on-site training at different communities that we service on the senior end of side with home care, with individuals that are at home. We've got all types of educational flyers. So we're big, great products great training. Um, and, and then we pick up the phone too. Sounds so simple, um, but so important. If somebody calls us, we answer the call. We answer the questions. We um, try to guide and help. That's probably our, 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 our key word there is we do our best to help people. And, um, and it's fun when it works. I mean, when Lorraine is saying that Jessica kid, I think her words to me were, we're going to Disney. <laughs> That, that that's the that's the that's the the, the fruits of the the labor is to hear that one person is going to disney well you know what that's a very important person all people are important that's going to disney so um that's what the kind of part of the quest is that makes it so gratifying and uh and i and i have to say in good faith 
every single person on our team feels that way. And that's pretty cool too. That's a rarity. That's a rarity. So um, yeah, very, very exciting times. The other thing that I think you guys do really well is to try to, you know, remove some of the stigmas, not only through your education, but you know, a lot of people don't want to wear a brief or a pull up because it's going to squeak or it's going to crunch or it's going to be bulky. And you guys have worked really hard at that as well. Um, or it, when Lorena had mentioned, I think it was Lorena had mentioned about, you know, if she had an accident, um, you know, that affects her, it affects you, but it affects everybody around you too, because people notice if it's, if it's liquid, if it's odor, if it's whatever, I mean, it, it does like Deanna, like you said, this has a ripple effect on all of us and how, you know, how are we going to deal with this? And so bringing the dignity back is, is huge, making people's lives easier, being able to bring that joy back for, for Lorena and her family and, and Jessica and, and Andrea too. It's got to make her life easier too. <laughs> when, when you take out, you know, that piece of the equation, um, it, it's, it's pretty incredible. Um, does anybody have any last comments here? I just think this has just been such a, a fascinating educational piece. And I, I love to use this platform to have tough conversations in a comfortable fashion. And so I really hope our audience felt comfortable listening to this because it's, it's important information that we get out here. So Dr. Laird, anything that you'd like to add? I, I do. I, I think this last part of the conversation as a physician is pretty humbling because urinary incontinence, you know, that's in my diagnostic book. You know, I can diagnose that. I can tell people how to, how to um, fix that. And I've got the prescription pad, you know, and I think this, this brings up a really important point that we talked earlier about how the diagnosis was difficult for Lorena to get. And it's a whole nother discussion of what was the care like, even after she got the diagnosis, was it focused on you know, her son and his individual needs? Was it whole person? Was it, you know, individualized? Was it comprehensive? And my, my fear is that the answers were to those questions were no, 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 and no. And so the, the care system for helping individuals with dementia, whether they're young or any age is still got a long way to go. But what this discussion shows is I want caregivers um, to realize how valuable other people who are in the arena of wanting to help with these kinds of illnesses, how important it can be to know about these things. So listening to a podcast such as this, talking to local groups or support groups and knowing the individuals in your community who are involved in these kinds of uh, care needs, you can often find additional information, even above and beyond what the physicians can do, because physicians should know that, you know, none of us do the entirety of the care that's needed, especially for these kinds of illnesses. So I just want to put a shout out for the, the collective of all of us who I hope will just continue to work together to make sure people find out about products like you know, SENI, programs like yours. Um, and I think that's where people are going to start, you know, being able to have the real, you know, help that they need um, to get through these uh, sorts of things and face the challenges and then have those moments. I love, Lorena, your attitude about, you know, finding the, the positive moments and, and bringing, waiting for, you know, working for the smile and the twinkle in the eye, that kind of thing. I mean, I really admire your attitude. So thanks for letting me participate. Well, thank you. Lorena, anything that you want to add? I, I can't, again, thank you enough for sharing your story. It's just such an important story for people to hear. Yes. Um, thank you so much for letting me be on the show today. And I want to thank Deanna for everything she's done for us. Amazing. Jessica is really looking forward. She's going to get to meet Deanna this next Disney trip. Oh. She's going to meet the Cine lady. She can't remember her name. But she's a cine lady and she's, you know, and stuff. Um, Dr. Laird, I can't thank you enough from, for being on this show and helping to get the word out because it is a big struggle for families, especially when you have somebody so young. In fact, David was compared 
during his at Rush University during his second round of neuropsych testing, he was compared to the population of Down syndrome, even though he didn't have it. He was special needs. He never got above five years old. He never learned to read or write. So thank you so much. No, you're welcome. Thank you. And Lori, thank you. Oh, and- it's always a pleasure having you on having you on the show. And please send our love to Jessica and Andrea as well and let them know they were missed. Deanna, I, I want to give people contact information for CINI. So if they just go to the CENI, S-E-N-I uh, hyphen USA.com, that will take them to our website. Okay. okay. And the CENI site has a nice locator, a store locator that works mm-hmm. really well. I've right. had people use and really like. You can put your zip code in and find a store near you. Okay. Um, and then... Um, an email address where we can help too would be um, Deanna, D E A N N A dot Vigliotta, V as in Victor, I G L I O T T A at, and this will be our, our parent company, but at T Z M O U S A dot com. And um, if somebody wants to talk with you, do they do that through the email system then? Or if they want to reach out to me, yeah, absolutely. I'll, I'll follow up. Um, and I don't want to close out either, Lori, without giving my thanks to each of you as well. Um, we always appreciate being able to share a platform and educate people, but I find each one of you inspiring in your quest, you know, and I, and again, I think we align and Lorena, I just think, boy, you're, you're an inspiration, um, for sure. And, uh, I wish nothing but the best for you and your family. Thank you so much. Well, thanks everybody. Um, please like, click and share this. So I think there's just loaded with information in here. And, uh, again, if we can all just have even an ounce of Lorena's positivity, we'll make this world a much, much better place. So thank you all. Bye now. Bye.